Hello, my name is Raymond Hughes, and I'm an, the interviewer uh, for the Veterans History Project for the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library. We are conducting an interview today in Upper Arlington, Ohio, a suburb west of Columbus, Ohio, at the Upper Arlington Public Library. Today's date is the 25th of June, 2015. And today we have the privilege and honor to interview World War II veteran John Alvin Bergman. And uh, Mr. Bergman, John, uh, what do you prefer to be called, sir? John. John, uh, if you would, I would just get a little uh, early biographical information from you. All right. Uh, before I, I turn the interview over to Mr. Rawlin okay. Lane, who is a okay. retired history teacher here in Columbus and a uh, World War II historian yeah. and, uh, and a friend okay. of yours. Uh, uh, John, uh, when were you born and where? I was born in Chicago, Illinois, right near Wrigley Field on the north side in July 6, 1920. I see. And what were your parents' names? My mother's name was Rose, who was a Swedish 16. At, she came to this country as an immigrant from Skåne, Sweden, and made her life here. Uh, my dad's name was John Bergman, and he was a salesman in Chicago for a large company in Chicago. And uh, what was your mother's maiden name? Do you recall? Her maiden name was Nelson. Nelson. Rose Bertha Nelson. I see. And uh, you went to early school in Chicago. I went till I was nine years old, and then my father was killed downtown Chicago, waiting for a streetcar on the loading zone, and my mother, being recently an immigrant into Chicago, never had worked before, really. And I was sent to Pittsburgh to live with my godparents, who had no children. And he, they were quite wealthy, so they were going to take me for a year until my mother <coughs> got on her feet. Well, each year went by, went by, went by, and I finished high school, went to college. They put me through college. Uh, just one second. What was your godparents' uh, name? Um, Alvin John. My name is John Alvin. Yeah. My. And their last name? My uh, Apple, A-P-P-E-L. Her name was Lillian Bergman Apple. She was my dad's sister. I see. They had no children, and they took me in. And instead of one year developed, I went all the way through school. And with them. What high school did you go to in Pittsburgh? Went to South Hills High School in Pittsburgh. Uh, was on a cheerleader there. Uh, I took uh, all accounting and mathematical mathematic courses because I wanted to become a CPA. I, see. I went to University of Pittsburgh for four years, taking accounting and math. During the summers. But I was off school. I worked for a CPA firm, a national firm, doing legwork in the field. So that was going to get me my certification when I got out of college. Did, uh, did you have any brothers and sisters? I had two cousins. The one uh, was a year younger than me, and the other, other one was a year older. The youngest one was in the Air Force. After I went to Pittsburgh, as he was of the age, he joined the Air Corps, trained the United States. Their company, squadron, was shipped. It was the 17th Pursuit Squadron out of uh, Chinook Field, Illinois. He was shipped to Philippines. And he was stationed at Nicholas Field. There were two there, Clark Field and Nicholas Field. Clark was north of 
Manila, the Nicholas Field was south of Manila, about 20 miles. And when they were bombed out December 7th, they ended up on Bataan. He was with the group that surrendered. He survived the 90 mile death march, but died in the prison camp in July. What was his name? Oh, his name was uh, John, or he called him Jack, uh -huh. the differentiator from me. Uh, the other brother was in the Air Corps and in Africa and survived the war. I see. But he died, he got home two years later, he died. He was home cutting the grass and he died, heart attack. Well, at this point, uh, I'm going to turn the uh, the interview over to Roland Lane, uh, mm -hmm. a close friend of yours, okay. and uh, let him, he is more familiar with your story and uh, okay. pertinent questions, okay. pertinent questions to uh, ask. And if you would, Roland, appreciate you uh, handling the the interview. Thank you. Uh, since John and I have uh, met up some time ago, it's, it's always been my privilege to hear him. Uh, I have made some notes from past interviews that I thought were uh, interesting things, but I've encouraged Ray to jump in at any time uh, because he has a military background that I don't have. So at any time, Ray may come in and uh, at his own volition and, uh, and ask some questions. Uh, this is a more of a free forum here today rather than a formal interview. Yeah. Uh, I wanted you to tell us a little bit about uh, you went into to Pitt, right? Right. Um, and you were a math major there? Math major. So I'd like you to tell a little bit of that story of um, uh, mathematics there and how did the Army find you? Right. What happened? I took math, accounting, shorthand, typing all through high school and then math and accounting at the University of Pittsburgh. I was a number nut. I loved mathematics, and I wanted to be a CPA. And CPA, you, you use that and get knowledge to find any errors in a corporation. I took every math course that was available in high school and college. I was just enjoyed doing it. I loved the numbers. A week before I was to graduate in May of 41, a man came from Washington and interviewed me. He says, Bergman, we'd like for you to enlist in the Army. You're 1A in the, dra in the draft. You're in perfect health. I said, well, I don't want to join the Army. I want to go out and earn some money for a while. If I'm called in later, fine. Well, we need you. And I said, what am I going to do? He said, we can't tell you. I said, well, I, give me some idea. Well, he said, I said, I had no military training. I didn't belong to any ROTC group. He said, uh, but I said, he said, yes, but you were a Boy Scout for 10 years. And I said, yes, that's right. And he said, your scoutmaster instructed you scouts in that <coughs> troop on Morse code. That was one of the <laughs> Singapore play, flags for the Navy. He was a, taught us a lot about being Boy Scouts. And I said, uh, I lost my thought. <laughs> uh, anyways, I said, I've had no ROTC training. He said, yeah, you're a Boy Scout. He said, that's good enough for us. We need you. I said, what am I going to do? He said, I can't tell you. But he said, if you join in 24 hours, talk to your folks, we'll give you a second lieutenant's commission. I thought, well, that's good. That's good money, and I could stand for that. So I did that, and a week later, I got a diploma in one hand and a one-way ticket to Fort Meade, Maryland. One way. So I went there, 1st of June, entered the camp, and met 24 other men similar to myself. We were almost clones of each other. So they had done a lot of research for fellows like myself. Uh, one guy was a German 
assistant professor at Penn, University of Pennsylvania. There was a young fella, Jimmy Como, was a Jap Japanese American in Hawaii. He was fluent with Japanese and Chinese. The German, the professor was not German, but he, uh, he was proficient in German. So they were our translators in the work that we did. Everybody asked me that, well, what'd you do about the language? Well, we learned a little bit about both languages. Uh, the Japanese language is very intricate, as the Chinese are, but there are certain symbols and certain words and letters that uh, you pick up very quickly. Uh, I'm trying to think. Well, did they tell you what your job was going to be? Nope. He didn't tell us, but he said there were three men are coming from Bletchley Park, England, who were code breakers. Well, we could understand that those words, but he said they're late getting here. They've been delayed. So we're going to fit you up. We gave us shots, signed up for the insurance, all the paperwork that had to be done. He said, we're going to give you a week off. You go home, they're going to make you uniforms, and come back in a week, and the code, these men from England will be there. So I went home, and that's when I got that picture on there. That's the only picture I have. When I came back to camp at the end of the week, by the way, this was ragtail uniforms. They just went in the warehouse and got stuff that would fit us. He said he had a box of patches there, a whole big box of patches, and there was a packet of each one. He said, each one of you take one of those packets and have them sewed on your uniform. We well, said, who are they? They were just miscellaneous patches. He said, we don't care. We just want a patch on your uniform. So no one will know who you are, really. I only met one man in the Chicago airport on going through there one time that was in that outfit. And as soon as I could get away from that counter, I got away. I didn't want to be involved in it. We weren't allowed to tell anybody what we were doing. The colonel said, you are not to tell anybody, nobody, not even an American officer, what you're doing. If anybody stops you or asks you or you're held for some reason, you just tell them to get hold of Washington and the army there will get your release. We carried a yellow card, business card, with the initial U on it, which stood for ultra. Uh. We had a yellow card, no name, no number, no identification except a U on the card. We carried no identification in our travels for five years. Well, it was, uh, that's a bit more of the story. So I went home, and by mistake, I didn't know this at that time, that we weren't allowed to take pictures. So I'm home with my girlfriend, had that picture taken with that uniform. When I back at, got back to camp and Colonel Johnson saw that picture, he blew a stack. He said, don't you, any, any of you men, ever have your picture taken any place? You are incognito. You are not known. You're innocent. Forget it. So we had to adhere to that. He also said, you are not allowed to tell anybody, nobody, what you are doing till the war's over. At the end of the war, when we got our discharge, we said, well, what about this code of secrecy? He said, we'll let you know when you'll be released to that. Well, they were afraid of the Russians and the French and the Chinese. It took us, every five years, we had a reunion in Washington of our 25 men. We kept asking the, well, it was actually the CIA at that time, when are you going to release us? Well, we'll let you know. Forty years later, in the 1980s, we were able to tell our wives, our children, what we did. My wife said, well, John, you lied to us? I said, we had a lie. We had to make up stories. I'll tell you later about another part about my eye. Well, uh, did you ever find out how the Army 
picked you guys out? It was your, your scores or what was it? My scores, every one of the 25 had an IQ of 160 or better. They were all A kids, really. But they were a heck of a nice bunch of guys. We had uh, Jewish, Catholic, Protestant. In fact, we went to each other's church. We'd go into Baltimore and go to one of the churches, just as a group, just to know more about whatever their religion was. Uh, what else would you say of that? Well, so someone in the government contacted these oh, de departmental heads in? or They went to a lot of the universities and asked them who would be a good candidate for the requirements that you've got. And my name was picked as one from the University of Pittsburgh. The girl that sat in my last math class, her father was the math professor. For some reason, he sat me next to her that last quarter, and he, we always worked on a project together. She was in the same state in school as I was. I was sent off, and in my first travel to California, going to Australia, I was at Treasure Island base. And I'm in the officer's club, and I look at the bar, and here's a young lady in a Navy lieutenant uniform, was the girl that sat next to me in college. She said she was interviewed the same day as I was. So that's how we two at Pitt were picked. And she was in the Navy, I was in the Army. You're pretty modest about what you do. Can I ask, were you, uh, I assume, with your love of math, and an IQ of that sort, you were darn close to the top of your class? I'd say I was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I, I'm, does I'm, mean number I'm, one then? I'm very modest, but uh, I gotta admit, I, I, I was an egghead and a smart aleck. Good kid, I was a good kid because I didn't want anything to reflect back on my, my uh, aunt and uncle who were my godparents. I wanted to be a, a, a good thing to them. So they plucked out the number one guy out of Pitt. Is I that basically they what they did? I think they did, yeah. Okay, all right. Want well, to get that established. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about going to Washington? You referred in one of your uh, uh, lectures about the house. There was a stone house of some sort they put the guys yeah. in. Yeah, actually I've got a picture of that pack of a house there. That actually is not really the true house, but I think it was torn down. It was an old farmhouse. The, when we got back to, K, uh, to camp, Colonel Johnson put us in the bus and took us to this, it was an old stone farmhouse, big stone farmhouse. There were electricians, uh, elect, uh, plumbers, carpenters, everybody working on that house, getting ready for us. They had a lot of rooms, so we were two men to a room. We had a cook, a driver, and a houseboy. They did all the dirty work around there. We worked in actually civilian clothes most of the time. Nobody was allowed in our building. There was a guardhouse at the end of the driveway surrounded completely by barbed wire. No one was allowed to come in that building. <clears throat> Even congressmen were refused. Once in a while, someone had permission to come and visit and find out what we were doing. I think they were on the appropriations committees. That's who I think they were. Any time any of those <clears throat> visitors or somebody outside come in and would ask us questions, we normally would refer them to Colonel Johnson. Because we weren't allowed to tell anybody what we were doing. The story on General Tibbets, I got to know General Tibbets real well after the war, very well, knew Andrea, his wife. And I was sitting in his uh, dining room having coffee one time after I got to know him. And I says, Paul, what do you know about the code breakers? He says, I didn't even know there was such a unit. He's a general, and he didn't even know there was such a thing. He says, all I can say is I got some damn good information on intelligence that was very helpful to him. One incident was over in, Ger in uh, Africa before he was sent back to Roosevelt. Uh, 
in the house where you were housed, how often did the 25 of you get together? We were together. There was one big room was opened up for us where we had these big uh, architect drafting tables. And we would get the tapes or the messages that came back to Washington that were considered priority. <clears throat> but most of it we tried to do as early as possible in the nearest locations. Like in Europe it was different, it was small all together. But in the Pacific you were over thousands of miles. So if a message was picked up, the picture in there you'll see in that group is these uh, six or seven uh, army men, I think, or Marines, I think they were army men, with uh, earphones on, mm -hmm. sitting there eight hours a day, ten hours a day, taking messages that were coming over from airplanes, squadrons, ships, submarines, what have you. And we had people on the islands down there, like tribal chiefs, retired uh, educators or farmers, farmers there. We supplied them with a radio and generally supplied them by air. They'd plane drop stuff for them. They were on the move constantly because the Japs were always around. So um, maybe this radio unit on this one with a tribal chief, and here's a guy over here as a farmer from Australia that has a home there, and they'd take the same message. Then that would be sent back to a clearing spot, and they would compare these messages, mainly the location that it was coming from, the triangle, and the message, because you had to be almost perfect picking up these messages. If you made a mistake in one or two letters, it would throw the message off. So you had to be very careful writing down. You left them blank if you couldn't, weren't sure what it was. Uh, the different types of uh, uh, coding that the Japanese used and the Germans used, um, not all of those codes were run through purple or through uh, the en Enigma machine, right? Over those years, there were a number of versions. The Enigma and the purple, Japanese uh, JT-25 machine, were very similar in their background. We had copies of those. Because before the war, banks in Japan would use them. They'd maybe dispose of them, get a new one. We'd pick up one. So we had ones down in Fort Meade in the warehouse. So they were something that were just not a new item. In fact, coding goes back to the Roman days. A lot of those various methods, using a round rod that you could twirl with the alphabets on it. <clears throat> the Japanese and Germans had their own language, but they had to use English or an American language <clears throat> because of the international trades. A lot of people don't realize that. Not everything they did was in Japanese. The Germans the same way. I'm going to hand you your water if you want to sip. Your yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to put a mint in my mouth. That's how I get it. Um, <clears throat> the first year and a half we were in working at Mead, we had to use our math skills to break messages that came back from some destination someplace. We had to use our math skills to break mainly the start was the code setting on the wheels of both the Japan and German machines. All those machines did was transfer a letter to another letter. They did not transmit until later in the war. Most of them were battery operated. We had copies of those over the years. They were made by IBM, National Cash of Dayton. So they were, weren't something that were real secret. The secret of that machine was the three wheels, cog wheels, that had the alphabet on it. And there was generally a series of maybe eight, 10, or 12 wheels. 
They were all numbered. And then the Germans, because they blitzkrieg through continental Europe, used the captured telephone lines and radio and so forth. In the Pacific, the important thing was to get information to all your every units every month or six weeks. The only way they could do that was they had a manual that they sent out to all their military installations all over the islands in the Pacific, Singapore, China, Thailand. That manual was put out, and on, in that manual, it would list the date. It would list the codings of the three wheels. Like, each one had an alphabet, a regular English alphabet. But it shows up in the front of the machine. The first wheel might be set A, the next one may set T, the next one is set W for that day. The next day, 24 hours, they would change that according to the book for the next day. They also had a column where later on they would only use the wheels, but they used plugs like the old telephones used to have in their exchanges, where the girl would plug in here and plug in here. That would, re that would change the circuit. After a year and a half, Alan Turing and his group invented the bomb. Well, what year would that have been? Forty, about the end of 42. Okay. And the bomb, by running it through all these trans, that trans tubes and these wheels, he'd run through a series of a message and it would pick up what wheels were being used that day. You wheel one, wheel two, wheel three. <clears throat> Machine was a keyboard, a standard type keyboard, international keyboard, with a key for each letter. Then the message would go through the machine and later on through these plug wires down below and it would light up it would go through these three wheels and then it would go to a one of the alphabet above which had a little light under it so if you press a it would go through the wires through the cog wheels through the way and then it would light up b the next letter would be d you print it, it would go through it. It was all hands like that. You didn't go like this, like a standard typewriter. You used your finger to do it. The next letter would come up D, maybe. The next letter would be M. You'd go through it and come back T. Then they would send that message by either wireless or radio. At the other side, they would pick up that on their machine. And the wheels were the same as the wheels that were being sent. They would put that message in there, and they would push a little key on the left that would reverse, the, and it would go back to the original message. Hmm. Really a very simple operation, and it was used for, I'd say, 200 years, those actual machines. But it goes back to the Roman days with their various units they had. In the movie, um, uh, the uh, British were uh, very frustrated at not being able to uh, to crack one of those since they changed it every night at midnight. That's right. Uh, in America, over at uh, Fort Meade, did you guys have any uh, uh, any better success before the, uh, the, the, the bomb was made? By the way, uh, the, he, what he calls the bomb, what the movie called Christopher. The same thing, right? Yeah, right. Okay. Did you have any luck? Uh, the, or first, the first year and a half that we were doing it by our heads, we were lucky to break maybe 10% of the messages. We didn't have, it was a grueling process. So the bomb cut it down to well over 
Were you in con? Uh, let me skip ahead just a little bit, and then we can continue to play with the machine. Uh, when did you first meet Turing? When did you make your first trip over to? Uh, made the first trip in '42. I was told by Johnson, Colonel Johnson, Bergman, you're going to re represent the Americans at Bletchley Park, England. He said, there's problems over there, and he said, Roosevelt has had word from Eisenhower that one of our men should go there. So Johnson said, you're going to be the one. So I flew over on a B-17 as a freight, and I met Turing, and the problem was, all through the war, even every year I did that, I go to Bletchley Park, our main thought was not the codes and the messages. We talked about the miscooperation between the Allies. We were afraid of the Germans, I mean the, the Americans, were afraid of the British, of the French. We knew there were French spies all over the place. We didn't trust anybody. The British didn't trust us the Americans or the other allies. So there was always a conflict at Bletchley Park, constantly. And it was especially among the higher officers. There's a big jealousy about that one of my grievances during the war was the way officers climbed on each other's backs, would do anything to get ahead. And Eisenhower didn't like it. He definitely didn't like it. I can tell you some stories about Roosevelt, about some of that was going on. But it, 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 it and it's going on today. I, I have fellows that I know that were in the Korean War, Vietnam War, and uh, they'll tell me about how it was aboard ship, how he was in the bases. It was just this idea of this class warfare going on. You want to go ahead and go right on into the time you're called to, to uh, 10 Downing Street? Well. The one year, the one trip I made to England, I know when I got there, Bernd Turning says, we're going to London. I said, what for? Well, they said, they just told us to come down. So we got on the train, went to, uh, to London. A car picked us up and took us to 10 Downing Street. Or I, I think it was 10 Downing Street. We go in, go right through. We end up in the basement war room. Maps on the wall, Churchill's there with a cigar, Eisenhower sitting there. Hell, at that time I was only a second lieutenant. I thought, boy, oh boy. Now Turing, he had a different agenda, but I was scared to death. We didn't talk about codes, we didn't do anything about any of the messages at all, and that kind of work. The meeting was about the animosity between the groups. What are we going to do about this cooperation among all the officers in code breaking? We got a war to win. We're going to have to win the war and cut out this chicken stuff. Well, that's what the meeting was about. That's all those two high people were worried about was cooperation. You could see how it was with Montgomery, how it was with George Patton. Everybody had their agenda. Some were good, some were bad. Did Churchill speak much, or was mostly ice? He puffed on a cigar, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, just that quiet thing. Eisenhower talked a little bit more. So, what was Eisenhower's message to you? Number one thing was, we are to go back to our unit and pass the word: if you don't cooperate with the British or any of the Allies, within reason now. He said, there's a doubt about Russia if you got a reason. If there's something about the French you don't like, the communist French, why, you've got a reason for it, fine. Otherwise, you're going to have to learn to cooperate. The British had an awful system, very, it was noticeable in that movie, The Imitation Game. A lot of the top rank officers were not military people. Most of them were either re related to royalty or to the hierarchy of the politics. Some guy was an earl or what have you. 
his son automatically moved up if he went in the service. Well, they were mismatches. They just didn't, they weren't modern. They were the old school. And we didn't have as much of that in the American. I don't think we had it. We had it, but not as bad. So Eisenhower's charge to you was what, specifically? You go back, you have a meeting with all these American officers, the code breakers, and explain we've got to cooperate with our allies. If they don't, they're going to be sent back to America and go into a trading group. Well, you didn't want to be sent back. That, that was terrible during the war. So <clears throat> it would get better for a while, and then it would just, at the end of the year, it would build up again. So it was a real problem. They couldn't, you saw in the movie, the objection he had among the British officers. I mean, they threatened touring every day. They just looked down on him like it was a paisan. So what was the reaction when you first told these officers that they had to cooperate? I said, fellas, when Eisenhower makes a decision, you better, better adhere to it, listen to it. Because if you don't, you're going to be in trouble and I won't see you again. So that's the way it went. You see then it? the next year it would slowly build up and then we had to bring them down to earth again. you see any visible reaction? When yeah, you some of them didn't like it, especially the ones that were really... A lot of officers and even the Americans were political officers. Their family was a congressman from Washington and he was brought into the army in some job, whether it was infantry, not infantry, I'd say it was more the transportation or the quartermaster. Most of the time, <clears throat> you had to have some ability if you were among the fighting men and the frontline men. So you told them that Eisenhower had your back? Oh yes, I said he has my back. Because Eisenhower said to me, no officer will ever give you any trouble. If you ever have any trouble, any of your men, if any trouble, any place in the world, you let me know and I'll take care of it. There'll be no discussion, I'll take care of it. And more than you had Eisenhower's back, you were, you were in good shape. How old were you when you told these guys this? Starting when I was 22. 22. 22. And you were a... a second lieutenant the first year. What kind of, did you have any personal nervous reaction when you were... Knees some... were shaking, I could hardly talk. I mean, this was big stuff. This was really big stuff. Had the machine um, been in operation, had it been successful by the time you got there? Or were they still Which getting the, it to work? The, 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 the bomb. Code machine, the bomb? Bomb. No, the bomb, it was, the first year I went there, the bomb was not working yet. You got a chance to see it? I got the chance to see it, and they were working on it. But the, the next time I went, the next year, it was an operation. So the part and the bomb took over, and the main purpose of the bomb was to figure out the wheel settings. It wasn't used for the messages, it was used for the wheel settings. So the part in the movie where the, uh, the, the five-man team there are, uh, were pouring over this stuff and trying to uh, tweak it and so forth, you were there at that time when that was going that on? That time, the first time I was over there, Turing was sitting at the desk with these other four or five men and <clears throat> trying to figure out mathematically what some of these messages were. Uh, we couldn't break many. It was almost, these machines made it very difficult. The gal that was in the film, just as, a, as an aside, Clark, was yeah. that pretty... Pretty, that was, I'd say that movie was 95% right. 5% uh, was build up mainly because he was homosexual and they wanted to commercialize that part of the movie. But the rest of the movie I think was very, very good. Very good. Uh, can we take a break a minute? We're back and uh, we're talking about uh, the, the, the bomb as you called it or Christopher as the movie called it and uh, your relationship with touring. Could I ask a, a question Oh, in the movie, that made uh, seem like he was uh, difficult uh, to communicate with. Did you have any problems of that sort? I knew he was difficult to communicate with. He he was in a world of his own. A brilliant mind had been like that all through college. He was 
brilliant guy, but he was on a different level. But for some reason, when I got there to met him the first time, he sensed what I knew and what my background was, and he really was really nice to me. Now, I knew he was a homosexual. I had been told earlier to be careful of that subject, so I never brought it up. So we never, the had never, he never apologized or said anything or what he got. He was just a normal guy as far as I was concerned. So your communication with him was, was uh, pretty good. You think maybe because your brains were on the same level? Oh, I think that was it. I could, when he would talk about something, I would be, I was able many times to chime in and talk about it. And uh, he was talking some mathematical item, and I'd just talk in with him. And, well, yeah, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. So in that, in, I'm trying to get more of that conversation. Until the time that the machine was working well, uh, what were people doing? Uh, the, the, you talk about the Cambridge Five. Uh, you explain who they were, and then what were you doing while he's trying to get the machine yeah. to work? Well, see what happened. <clears throat> we were getting all these messages coming back either to their units around the continent or to their spies in England. There were a lot of spies. We've got thousands of spies in the United States right now. You don't realize these other countries send people in with their doctors, with their lawyers, with their businessmen, with their, their farmers. It, it's a, it's a cat, it, cat and mouse game. So uh, while he's trying to get the machine working, yep. What did you and the, the Cambridge other, Five? The other people in his unit were trying to figure out how they could do something with the codes that were brought in by messages and by tape, how they could break the message. We had to do that by our head. And I'll give you a clue. Number one, we found out practically every German message that was sent out of headquarters to some unit or submarine or ship, any place, an aircraft carrier uh, or an aircraft unit, some place in the message they'd say, Heil Hitler. You can't believe how the German people had been instilled everything. When you saw these thousands in the stadium, Heil Hitler. The people just lived with that officers would send a message from one place to another. They'd put in that message in the beginning, at the end, or someplace, Heil Hitler. The Japanese did the same thing with their emperor. Is that right? And with Heil Hitler, it's 10 letters. You get those same 10 letters configured, helps you, that's a crib, that gives you a chance to open the message up. But the bomb was the big help because it took away 50% of the work by giving us what the setting was on. Then we'd put it through the machine. Then we'd translate it. I have a question related to it. Uh, in the movie, uh, Turing was threatened uh, for a total shutdown. Uh, he asked for six months. In the movie, they said, we'll give you one month. Uh, then he succeeded in getting the thing working. Uh, and simultaneously uh, decided that that group would not communicate very much with the high command for fear of leaks and so forth. That's right. So the question is, since those guys were going to fire him if he didn't get the thing completed, and he's pretending in a sense that he never did get it completed, how did that work that he didn't get fired? Because Churchill is his back. And he had decided early on, this guy has got the brains and the ability to do more than what these other people are doing. That he was gonna be able to make the back through. It was a decision he made and it was, it was brilliant. Same way with Asdar, with all his handlings with uh, uh, Patton and Clark and all those fellas, <clears throat> he had the way of playing all of them without them really realizing what, the, what, what, what he was doing. 
he was really, uh, really, I don't know, I got to give him credit for what he had to do. I think he did a wonderful job. There was a lot of British propaganda in the 50s and 60s when I was growing up, uh, which really painted uh, Eisenhower as sort of a ho-hum, uninvolved uh, figurehead type. And uh, a lot of that seemed to come out of uh, the British, uh, Mc Mc Montgomery and so forth. Yeah. Uh, and you found that not to be true, is that correct? Not true, no. Eisenhower, I've got to give him credit. He did the job. He was a hero in my eyes. Now, I know about a couple of the generals, and especially my story, one story about early in the war, real early, we had orders Joe Kennedy, the president of the uh, son of the uh, father of the president, was ambassador to England. Early in the war, our orders were to give copies of the messages we did break. A copy went to Kennedy every week. After a short while, some of that information we gave Joe Kennedy was coming back from Berlin to their spies that were second and third agents. In other words, they were German agents, but we had caught them. And threatening to kill them, they became a double agent. So the message is coming back to those double agents who were acceptable, was telling information that we were given Joe Kennedy. So we got a hold of Roosevelt and said, we've got a problem with the ambassador. We've got to do something about him. What do you mean? He gets copies of all our transcripts that are successful. But that information is coming back from Berlin for some reason. He said, well, politically wise, I can't do anything about Joe Kennedy. But he said, change the messages that you're giving Joe Kennedy. Just change the information. Delay it or change the information. And he says, I'll, I'll, I'll follow through the rest. Well, it was shortly after that, Joseph was sent back to the United States. But Joe Kennedy <clears throat> was a very, very close friend of Roosevelt's. They were in the real estate business in Massachusetts together. A lot of people don't know that, but they were in business together. And because of that business interest, they both had sons they wanted to be president. Both men wanted their son to be a president. Well, of course, Kennedy's son was killed, the one he had favored. The next one would have been John. Uh, so he was recalled, sent back to the States, but nothing ever got out about it. Jo that, that's one of the stories I tell. Joseph Kennedy was very close with Neville Chamberlain. Yes. Uh, did you speculate on how this stuff was was making the turnaround? Was just sloppy? Sloppy. Uh, just sloppy. But you didn't see anything sinister on the part no, of... Uh, no, I don't think it was sinister. But he was telling information that we were... No, was coming from Berlin and we were trying to cover up so they wouldn't divulge our situation. You traveled the world trying to uh, find uh, the code books, and uh, you had one mission where you were sent to Burma. Yeah. you want to talk about that? Well, that code book, the Germans had it and the Japs had it. And that was the secret, really, of our code breaking, was the setting of those machines. Cause a submarine out the, the submarine wolf pack out in the Atlantic Ocean was getting the messages from that book, the settings. There was a problem with the enemy and their code their code machines. If a, they didn't even the way we got the copies of the Enigma from the Polish early before the war. That's another story, too. But the way that transpired, really, that, that went together, 
I'm trying to think how I can put this to words. Um, better Holderman. Uh, stories I could tell you for five years that's hard to just, you know, stay on the one story. You go any rabbit hole you want to go, that's fine. Yeah. Because anything okay. you say is going to be new to us. Okay. Um, now, what's in my thought was, what was the last thing I Polish. said? Polish. Uh, oh, the Polish. The Polish, um, the story there was that uh, the Germans had this Enigma machine, which had been used for years, so nothing new. But they were updating it constantly. They had a department. The code people that were making those machines and the ones that used the machines were never rated well. An officer that was in charge of a, of a uh, one Enigma machine, the guy under him was just a lowly soldier or sailor, what have you, that he was using it. And the, the class hatred between them was so, so strong, it was amazing. Well, the Polish were working with the Germans on these machines. They were working together. They're both engineering departments. Well, the one, the one, the two Polishmen talked to the one German who was not making any money and was not accepted in the hierarchy, bought a copy of the technical manual, how do you make that machine and put it together. That was before the war. They gave it, the Polish gave that to the French. They didn't want to fool with it. They weren't interested, so they gave it to the British. Well, that's when the British got the British telephone company, who did all the mechanic and the post office department did all the mechanical work for England, and that's when they started to make copies of the machine and how it worked. That's when we figured out about that high Hitler and, and glorious uh, emperor. All right, next. you're taking us to Burma. Oh, at the end of six weeks, while we were being trained the six weeks at Meade, men coming in drafted or enlisted that had any experience or working knowledge of radios, telegraphers, Morse code, anybody was involved, a repairman on radios. They were sent to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey to the Army Radio School. At the end of six weeks, we were finished. Each one of us, 25, had to take one, two, three, or four of those men someplace in the world where one of them had a, there was a listening station someplace. And we had to take these fellas where a station had one operator we could give them two, or we could give three, depending where it was located. So I had to take three men to Australia. I flew to Treasure Island, San Francisco. That's where I met that woman in the officers' club. Then we got a plane the next day to Hawaii, and that's when I met Roquefort. That was my first meeting. I had heard about him, but I never met him. Well, we were there two days because of plane connections, getting an empty seat on a plane. Then we flew to Wake Island, then we flew to uh, Australia, Melbourne. We got off the plane, the colonel said, uh, Bergman, we got uh, orders to send you to Calcutta. I said, what do I want to go to Calcutta for? I said, I want to go back to Washington. He said, we got orders to get you there and we're going to fly you there. So they flew me to Calcutta. I get off the plane, there's a colonel waiting for me. He says, Bergman, we've got a mission for you. We understand you are involved in the codes. And he said, the Cation Indians in North Burma, in the upper hills of North Burma, right near the China border, the Chinese have been coming down there with squads, companies, divisions. They want to take over Burma and ja then take over India. Japanese? The Japanese. The Japanese. Japanese right. came down the China Trail, and they're going to want to take over even India. So these Cation Indians told the British there 
that they had built a little radio shack that was a communication point there, also monitoring our planes going over the hump. So we knew they had a radio shack. They'd have to have a book. They'd have to have a machine. So he says, I've got 12 rangers here with a master sergeant, a medic, and if we're going to fly you to within reason of that location, and these three Cation Indians are going to meet the plane, take you up the trail, they're going to take over that radio station when it's possible. Some days there would be a dozen Japs there, permanently. Some days there'd be 200, an infantry company coming through some other group coming through. So they're going to make sure they can take over the station. So you stay here with the medic and one of the Indians, and we're going to start up there and we're going to take that station. There was some weeds in the field, so they were able to get, you know, camouflage through it. Just as the first guide, Indian guide, started out of the trees, there was an explosion. I don't know whether it was a hand grenade or whether it was a landmine or a concussion bomb, but it struck, I didn't wear glasses. It struck me in the face and oh, it hurt. And my hand, I had blood and fluid. And the medic, that I got, I was on the ground. He said, I'm gonna put some sulfur powder in there and give you a shot of morphine. And, uh, but it, I was in shock. And the sergeant said, our cover's been blown. We can't take a chance. There may have, been, may have been more Japs back further or within that vicinity. So we got to get out of here. So we started down the trail. They didn't come after us. That meant there were only a dozen or so there. But we should have went on. But that was his decision. He was in charge of the, the, uh, the uh, project. So we went down, radioed the plane, which was just over the borderline into northern in India. So we'd come over a couple hours later and picked us up. They never came after us. We got in the plane. I'm sitting next to the sergeant and he pulled out a little metal container. He said, I guess we won't need these. And I said, what's that? He opened it up. Here was 13 cyanide pills. He said, if there was any danger on this mission for us to be captured, Every one of you would have taken one pill. And if you wouldn't take the pill, I was to shoot you and then shoot himself. That's how that mission went on. Well, they flew me back to, uh, to Calcutta, back to Australia, then all the way back to Philadelphia, Valley Forge General Hospital in Philadelphia. And they took me in, operated on my eye and my socket, and stitched up the eyelid. And when I woke up, and it wasn't a very difficult operation. It isn't like you're, it's like an appendicitis. In other words, it's over in 20 minutes. I woke up, who's sitting at the bed but Colonel Johnson. I said, Colonel, what are you doing here? He said, well, I had to be here. I said, why? I said, these are all Americans. Well, we don't, we're afraid you might talk. You might say something about where you were, what happened, or what you're doing. We can't take the chance. I said, well, they're all American nurses. Ameri he says, nobody knows what we're doing. We have to emphasize that. He said, uh, I said, great. I said, the war's over for me. I'm going back home. That's about three months after I've been in the service. He said, what do you mean you're going to go home? You've got one eye, that's a good eye, and you've got a brain on you. He said, we're going to keep you for a while. <laughs> well, it kept me five years. And I got along fine, got a driver's license, worked after the war. But that was, <clears throat> that was it. And then part of that was, Johnson said to me, now listen, you're going to be holding, talking to your folks. You're going to be seeing your folks and girlfriends and so forth. <clears throat> you know you've been going out to the rifle range at Fort Meade once a month or every six weeks to keep familiar with weapons. You tell them the Springfield rifle misfired. There was a bolt action. action that 
said, uh, that's your cover story. You, nobody questioned it. There wasn't one person there. And also, when I first went to me, Johnson also told every one of us a cover story. Bergman, you're an accountant. You tell people you're doing payrolls in Washington. So whenever I went home, what am I doing? I'm doing payroll. Fine, you're an accountant, you're doing payroll. No one ever questioned me. It was a good cover story. I go around to the schools every year in November. Only one girl at Worthington High School, Thomas Worthington, after I gave my, they, they separated us into different um, units in the library or the gym and so forth. And this one, I, this girl came up to me after the 15, 20 minutes discussion. She says, what did you tell your girlfriend or your mother about your eye? And I said, I told her that cover story. There was only one head the smarts they asked me out of all those 10 years of going to the schools. Just that one girl at Worthington. Where did you go to get the replacement eyeball? Oh, right there. During the war, when the war began with Germany, we got about 90% of our glass eyes from, Washington, from Germany. When the war came on, that supply was cut off. So they had a department in the ophthalmology department where they were using acrylic. Like they make false teeth, they make plastic eyes. That's a shell. When they operated on me and cleaned it up and sewed it everything, they sewed a little glass ball, like a little miniature marble, to the muscles of my inside socket. This is a shell with my iris out in my eye. It fits right over that. Now about every six years the VA replaces it. Twice a year I get it cleaned and polished because the, the tears uh, harden on there and become rough. But it's just like if you have false teeth, it comes out. One girl asked me one time, well, can you see of it good? Well, it's not connected to any nerves. But anyway, that's the story about that. Uh, John, uh, if you would, you told us about your first visit in 1942 to uh, Bletchley Park and meeting Churchill. Yeah. You went back again and met him again, didn't you? Oh, yeah, I went back. And also, if you would, cover that spy that was part of uh, well, the Bletchley Park. He, the one fellow, was part of what's called the Cambridge Five. And they were all anti-war. I was amazed how strong they were and working at Bletchley Park. But the British knew that. But a good way to cover them and keep them under control was to keep them away from any of the operations that were separate and good. So they actually were with the group, but anything with, that was developed or discovered, they were excluded from the meeting. So they didn't talk, and they advised the other ones in the group not to say anything. And they, they recognized, they knew who these guys were. Did you, did you know, I'm sorry? No, no, were all five of them spies or just? They weren't spies, but they were sympathizers, sympathizers to the other sides. The gentleman in the movie that was identified as a Russian spy, uh, when they found the uh, uh, part of his code in the Bible, him. You knew him? Yes. Well, I met him. And you knew that he was a spy? I knew that. Turing told me that. <laughs> and uh, uh, Turing was, as I say, good to me. He trusted me. He talked to me. I was, I was lucky to have got in with him. I really was. And I avoided anything about his sexual affairs. I just, we never even brought the subject up. I didn't want to embarrass him, and I didn't want to embarrass myself. Was he married to that woman? No, he never married her. No, he never married her. He wanted to, but his, he knew he couldn't perform with her. 
and he didn't want to ruin her life. It hurt, it hurt him very much. Did you meet her? Yeah, I met her, Clark, I met her, yeah. Very nice girl, she was a typical young girl that she actually fell in love with him. She, she fell in love because of his knowledge and his actually more so, more fi less physical and more knowledgeable. Was the girl in the movie, uh, did she do a good portrayal? Oh, she did a good job. She did right. And she uh, conveyed being hurt. Mm -hmm. Regardless of how he felt, she was hurt. Now, your second meeting with Churchill, when did that happen? It was about what, a year later. Why did you go there? We went there because Churchill wanted an update on what happened the last year. How were we getting along? And I said to him, from what I see at Bletchley Park, there are so many of these hotshot German, I mean, uh, English royalty or political officers. They're climbing on each other. And that it's, it's a dangerous thing. It's not helping the war effort. He knew that. He just wanted to hear it said. So he said, just keep doing what you're doing, and we'll go on for that. Were you at 10 Downing Street then? I think, I think it was at 10 Downing Street, and it was in the basement. Mm -hmm. Went down a number of flights. Was, uh, oh, all these maps on the wall. He had a big desk there and a cigar in his hand all the time. He had a lot of charisma, and I think what the British did to him, I think, was terrible, really. It was politics. Right. People hated him. You got it in Washington now. They can't get along. It worries me. It really worries me. Would you like to talk about the, uh, the Guadalcanal and Yamamoto? Oh yeah. There's a. Yes. In there, there's a. Uh, uh, no. It's. It's the message. There. <clears throat> when we first became affronted with the Japanese in the South Pacific as the war progressed. At Guadalcanal, the Japs were building an airfield and it, we tried to invade there. We made landings, but they were giving us a real hard time, mainly because the troops and the ones that went in there were not efficient working units of the American military. They were some draftees, some non... See, whenever the war started, anybody that was in a training camp was permanent cadre. Very few of them in the first year or two went into combat because they were training people because they had been in the army for five, ten years. So. We eventually started to get Marines and train men in there, and we were turning the tide of battle. We took over the field, the airfield. That was very important down there. Well, at the far north of Guadalcanal to the west, northwest, was Rabol. That was the, their Navy base and supply location. But when we started to take, we took over the airfield, and were taking over the rest of Guadalcanal. We were beating them handily. Great fighters. I'm telling you, the first group that went in, the second group that went in, there were good, real hard fighting men. One day this message came over about ETA, so forth. <clears throat> it was Yamamoto sent a message from Tokyo that he was going to fly to Rabo and survey the military effort that was going on there because they couldn't afford to lose Guadalcanal or the nearby islands because they wanted to invade Australia. That was their intent. In fact, they sent some men over the mountains of those, dragging their artillery and everything over those mountains to then go over and invade Australia. That was definitely, they wanted to guard their back on that end. 
he sent a message, and the guy that his radio transmitter of that message of arriving there at Rabol at that time, Yamamoto, who planned the attack on Pearl Harbor, he was their best efficiency military man. He was a brilliant man. He said early in when he they were going to uh, attack Pearl Harbor, we have to beat the Americans at Pearl Harbor and take over one year. If we don't take it over in one year, we'll lose the war. That was his and the military council. In, in, in Japan, there was the emperor and his group, and then there was the military group. And there was a big separation between those two. They revered the emperor, but they believed in the military command. So he sent that message in this code. He sent it in numbers. John, I don't interrupt. What would you think if I were to hold that up? Go ahead. And uh, you point. I'll, okay. I'll use your good eye. Okay. Otherwise, I'd let Ray do it. Yeah. And I'll hold the thing up here. Okay. All right. See how a cameraman can yeah. focus on that. And is, is are you getting that okay? All right. Close okay. enough. So John can sort of. Yeah. Uh, is that better, or is it not worth the effort? Okay. All right. Go ahead, John. Can you? Well. <clears throat> The man in Tokyo, the radio operator, had this message that Yamamoto was going to fly to Rebo, and his estimated time of arrival was on the date and time. Yamamoto was a definite on time. He was very prompt in everything he did. So his plane and five or six pursuit plane, guard planes, flew into Reb were flying into Rebo. We took P-38s out of Henderson Field that we'd just taken over and put extra tanks under the wings, which was devised by Charles Lindbergh previously. A lot of people condemn Lindbergh, but he was a real help in the early part of the war, although he was in Germany, and that's another story. But he was a, a believer in extending pursuit planes to protect bombers. This group of, I think it was five or six P-38s, met Yamamoto's plane near Red Bull, because we were there exactly almost on the minute, shot Yamamoto's plane and his pursuit planes, his fighter planes, protection. All were killed. The Japanese people didn't know Yamamoto had been killed for one year. That's how important it was to their effort. But you'll see when the message was sent in numbers, this, this, the letters, English letters were here. It's a seven by seven block. And if you see down here, when the message was sent, all those numbers are under seven. So we knew the code book pattern of that puzzle was one of those. So it made it easy for us to decipher the message. So that message came to you in Fort Meade? No, no. No, no. no that, all that was done on the South Pacific. Okay. They picked it up and their code stations that were working down there breaking messages. Now if they got a message that they couldn't break, they would send it back to Washington. Now there was Vent Hill, there was Arlington Hall, that was a uh, Catholic girls' school they took over, and the Navy Department all had code groups. So they worked on messages. We, the messages we got were the important ones that they couldn't do anything with. But the trouble is, any message sent that's more than five or six hours after it's been accepted or received, it's no good. You, most of your messages is an immediate action. They didn't send the message what was going to happen next week or three days later. It was going to happen within 24 hours or so. So for the math dummy that's sitting beside you, which is me, uh, go ahead and un unscramble the puzzle for us. You said it was in a box of seven. 
Right. Uh, where do you go from there to, to, to understand it? Well, the message came through with these numbers. In other words, the message itself that was either by radio or by wireless was 15, 36, 11, 73, 77. You'd go like on the first one, E, 15. Well, you go up here, E was here. Well, you go, the first column is one. The one the column across is five. So 15 is estimated arrival. How long would it take you? Could you arrive at that, what E was, just by probabilities? Well, as soon as we saw there was n nothing over seven, okay. we knew this block, this puzzle block, was a, was a, the, the, the basis of that message. All right. Now there's other ones where you shift the two, you'll have 26 letters here, and then you'll shift the bottom ones over one spot or two spots or three spots. Mm -hmm. So they called the Pandora box, there was the golden bug, there was all these different, we had a manual with about 200 sheets in it that had one of these puzzles on each sheet. Right. Yeah. So the combinations had already been worked out. Right. Okay, let's raise over there, get that. So the immediate effect in your mind of the death of Yamamoto was what? Oh, there was so much infighting among the politicians and the and their military that uh, with the without the sound judgment of Yamamoto, the morale really just fell real fast. And then, of course, the hierarchy of the were said adamant that they were going to continue fighting and. Uh, uh, this this broke their back. It really broke their back to our favor. Uh, did we cover enough of, of, of Lieutenant Roquefort? Uh, did we we didn't really do that, did we? Well, there's not much I can tell you. When I was there for two days, uh, I immediately went over. Roquefort invited me in to their code room. It was in the basement of this one building, and he was in their bathrobe. And he wore because uh, he was there 24, 23 hours a day. I mean, he, he just lived there. He was raised in Tokyo, and he was part of the embassy there. And he spoke fluent Japanese, level-headed guy, smart guy. Well, he was transferred then to, to Hawaii. The station was called Hypo, H-Y-P-O. And then, of course, when we were destroyed on the 7th of December, I think they got the band from the Arizona that was not on the ship at the time to be part of their code group, that expanded their code group. We found, whenever we went to meet originally, one of the criteria of some of the men that were in our group, their expertise was music. We found that music experts or people good in music are very adaptable for breaking codes. Mm -hmm. It's all mathematics, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were talking about him as characteristics in his bathrobe and so forth. Uh, you had a chance to chat with him? Chatted with him, talked with him. We talked over some of the codes and about the ones that on. I had knowledge of all these different uh, codes that they're using and we talked about uh, this idea of the, they were finding out the same thing with the Japanese the ones that were sending the message in Tokyo the military officer would give a message to a code clerk and he would put it in code by his book hand it to another one to transmit it. If the guy that codes the message, and this is 
This sounds simple. If he had a bad night the night before, he got into his desk or shop or whatever he was the next morning, and he's late. He picks up his code book and he uses the code book for the previous day. They would code it, send it through. A lot of times the other end would get the message and would say, we can't, they send a message back. We can't interpret your message because it's not coding right. Then this guy, to protect his back, would correct, look in the book, make the sheet turn over, and send the message through. So that morning, we had two messages that we could compare with the one I'd, we'd worked in all day yesterday. We immediately could work on this message immediately and probably break it. How often did that type of thing happen? Very often. And it was the same thing with the Germans. And, and you said they, they ended a lot of, the Japanese ended a lot of their messages with praise of the emperor or some, some way use the emperor's name. And it was almost universal. As the war went on, almost every message has had that. They took time to put that in. Which gave you a key to breaking the code. Yeah, it did. It was, it was going to call us a crib. A crib was an entrance into the message. But it was amazing that they made mistakes and we made a lot of them too, I can tell you. There was a lot of mistakes made, a lot of mistakes. Anyone that stood out in particular? Oh, or you sort of bury that? I buried that, I'd say, yeah. <laughs> we didn't want to talk about good. We didn't want to get someone in trouble. We warned them. We would get word to them, hey, you made a mistake. Don't do that again. So after you uh, got out of the hospital and were recovering, oh. um, you went back to... Uh, went back to Fort, Fort Meade, Meade, and I just went on with my regular work. I made trips around the world. I visited India, Australia, Pearl Harbor, Africa. What were you doing in Africa? Same thing. We had stations there. As time went on and we took over more property, we'd have a trailer or a truck with a, a crew with headphones listening to uh, the different officers, instructions from Berlin, instructions from Rome to their, their groups, and uh, we were very strong there. We found out there was one case, uh, there was a, um, uh, an officer club in, or a state, a state Department club in Egypt, and there was a mole there, and he would hear different conversations and they would pass that word back to Berlin and to Rome. So it was going on all over the world, all over the world. I'll tell you another good story. Paul Tibbetts told me this. When Paul Tibbetts uh, was bombing Germany out of England early, he had, I think, 25 missions, they decided to send him to Africa for the invasion. Well, after the invasion had happened, Tibbetts had to fly down from England, and he flew, by the way, uh, on one of those, he flew Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. Eisenhower sat on a two-by-four in his plane up in the cockpit while Tibbetts flew from England down to, I think it was Algeria. Well, Tibbetts arrived there, and what's the guy's name? Um, oh, General. Norstead, who was a very strong politician, became NATO. Right. Norstead. He called Tibbetts in and he said, we found a couple of these German ports in Algeria that are bringing in supplies for Rommel. We want you to bomb them, but we want you to bomb them at low levels. And Tibbetts said, it'll be just a bloodbath. We won't have a chance against their aircraft, their uh, um, anti-aircraft guns. Norse said, that's what you're going to do. 
Norse, he said to Norstead, well, if I'm going to do that mission with my crews, he says, will you fly right seat with me? <laughs> Norstead got real hot on the collar. Boy, he, he says, Tibbets, you do what I said. And Tibbets says, I will not make that mission that way. So Tibbets flew the high-level mission. Norstead told somebody down the chain that he's going to court-martial Tibbets. The general, there was the Air Force general, got word. Akers? Huh? Baker? No, it was, um, what's the other one? Hep Arnold? Hep Arnold heard that through somebody, and they said, Norstead has got the go for Tibbets. Arnold arranged for Tibbets to get in the next plane to Washington. Uh. He got him out of there before Norstead could do anything. And when, Norstead, when Tibbets got there, shortly thereafter, he had a call from White House. We want to see you. And Tibbets went to the White House, had a personal meeting with Roosevelt. And that's when Roosevelt asked Tibbets the question, have you ever been in, in civilian life? Were you ever in trouble at all? And Tibbets thought a minute and he said, one time when I was a young fella, I was at some place in Florida, and I was out one night with another with a young girl, and a, a guard of some kind found them in the car, and that was a mark against him. And Roosevelt already knew this, but he wanted to know whether Tibbets would say that. Uh. He trusted them. And that's how Tibbets was then, had, Roosevelt had made his mind up about the 509th and that bomb mission. Mm -hmm. But he wanted to find out how far Tibbets would go about that. And Tibbets told the truth, and he says, okay, fine, Paul, that's all. And that's how he got on that, that uh, 509th yeah. composite group. Yes. You had a question about Joe Desch? Oh, uh, did you know Joe Desch, D-E-S-C-H, from NCR in Dayton, Ohio? I was there one time. I don't remember seeing him, but actually, Turing came to the United States during those war years. Oh, he did? He was actually at Princeton for almost a year. Oh, is that right? And I spent some time with Alan, either in Princeton or we made a trip to Dayton and went through the operation and saw them making these cogwheels for that machine. And he actually was here almost a year. A lot of people don't know that. That part's not in the movie. It wasn't in the movie. Uh, yeah. And you toured with him? You toured with him, went through it because we knew each other and we went together. So NCR made the cogwheels for the for the they, for the bomb. And the IBM and uh, one other made it. it. wasn't GE. It was somebody else. There were three companies making them. They were making those uh, cogwheel, not cogwheels, uh, not transistors. Now they were uh, the disc. No, they were tubes. Vacuum tubes. Tubes. They had the tubes, and then they had the wheels. The vacuum tubes. Yes. What, what does this signify? Uh, this is the frequency of the alphabet that occurs in 60% of the messages. These are less so. These are where you get two letters together. This is where you've got words like T-H-E and T-H-A-T. It's the Frequency of the those. Frequency of it are coming up. So right. you use that mathematically in your mind. Right. 
When you're looking through the message, you look for those. I see. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. When you got a bunch of guys, this is a side question, and then I want to ask you if there's anything that comes to mind. You said you got hundreds of stories. It's something that we should uh, surface in there. Um, I want to ask you if you're working with a bunch of guys who have 160 IQ uh, and beyond, 25 of them, uh, do people, how would you characterize the thinking? Is it deeper? Is it broader? Is it both? Is it quicker? Uh, is it all three? Or can you tell a difference? It's deep thinking. And every one of us played chess. We played bridge. We played a lot of bridge. Four of us would get together and we had a chance. We'd sit down with a cup of coffee and a deck of cards. and We'd play bridge as long as we could, could do it. If we had a half hour, if we had an hour, if we had 15 minutes, we got the cards out and played a hand of bridge. We loved to play com a competitive bridge. We all tried to outdo each other. There was a notion that, uh, uh, an evil notion, I think, that went through American education about 20 years ago that you really could not extend uh, the power of your brain. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about that? I, I think the, brown, the brain is a, can carry a lot more than we use it. The brain can be trained to accept a lot more de information than what the normal person does. They get tired, they get distracted. So the tail end of the question is, the movie made a lot about uh, crossword puzzles. Yeah. Um, if uh, the guys are able to crack that in under six minutes and so forth, uh, if someone picked up crosswords from scratch, uh, could they, through the years, increase something up there that computes faster? Did you see people improve their time? Yeah. Uh, that took those original tests? I think their, their knowledge and education background alerted the mind to do that. I think, think the mind, it's like I've also said about uh, the Morse code, it's like driving a car, you'll do things automatically. When I see a message, when I type a message, I'm looking at a book over here, I'm going like this and I'm typing, uh, it's just automatic. Driving a car is automatic. You're, you have the music on, you're, you're thinking about what you're going to do for supper and where you're going to go. Your mind's just coordinated. But, but you have to educate your mind and keep up with it. you have a story tucked back in here somewhere that we should know about? Well, I, I, I was talking about this Bletchley Park. That originally was an old stone mansion. And then right before the war, it was sold to a man who wanted to make a, a restaurant out of it. When the war came on, the government asked that fellow whether they could use that castle. And he agreed to let him have the use of it. And that's when they brought these people, professors, touring that group from Oxford and Cambridge, which was this. Bletchley is between Oxford and Cambridge, going north from London. And they made that, and then they brought in all these young people from the colleges that were just 18, 19, 20-year-old girls. I was amazed how you could have eventually, at the end of the war, 10,000 people working there, a lot of them of women that were living in homes or above bars someplace in the town of of Bletchley. Some of them would, were even further out, they'd pick them up by bus and bring them in. But I was amazed none of them really ever talked. They were, and women talked. And with these, that house, that uh, big uh, stone mansion, they start out with these, what they call huts. They start out with one, then two, then five, then ten, then close to, I think there were more, more than twenty. Well, the Navy Department had one, the Army had one, the Air Force had one, France had one, China, not China, um, any of the other allied countries had them there. Uh, 
message that would come through and Turing and them would, would uh, decipher them, the messages were then sent to a person at a desk who would sort the information, where it came from, what it was. Then a copy of that was taken to that hut, knock on the door, hand on the message. Then it was up to them to handle it. And like the Air Force, they'd get a, a message from Berlin that they were going to send a squadron to Budapest or some place like that, or the Felicity oil fields. That would go in to that group to work on it. So you didn't ever have anybody, many, there were some that were controlling things, but it was all individuals. So that someone in this hut working on their messages would go home and the other girl roommate of hers above this bar during the war, they would never talk about it because they were two different operations. That's why they didn't, we didn't worry about them talking because one was doing one thing, one was doing the other thing, and there was no interest in the two. Towards, towards the end of the war, or in, during the war, were they able to decipher these messages on a daily basis, or did it take more than a day, or normal? As time went on, there was enough people working, like there were 25 of us at Mead. Mm -hmm. So when one guy had a message and he was having trouble with it, he wasn't picking up an idea on it, he'd pass it on to some, or have someone sit over here with him. The two of them would talk about it. And sometimes neither one could figure out. We'd pass it on to a third person. Because someone's mind was maybe going to pick something up on it. Were you involved in ever deciphering a, a message that if you had not disseminated it, one of our, or a group of our men would be killed, but you were required to hold it back? That happened several, many times. And I think that was the hardest part of our job. I really think when we walked away from that table, we knew someone was going to get killed, many were going to get killed, and we just couldn't break the message. Now, a good example, you've heard of Coventry. We got a message through that they were going to bomb, bomb Coventry. We evacuated most of the women and children, and then some of the men. We didn't evacuate everybody, because we wanted to know, wanted to be sure it was bombed and that we didn't evacuate the town. There was enough time lag. So you didn't tip your hand to the We didn't, didn't want to tip the hand. And the same thing in Italy, the Italian ships taken cargoes of supplies, ammunition, oil, and everything, constantly were coming out of Naples and Rome and the other ports. We were breaking the messages of those supply transport groups coming through. But we didn't sink everyone. And we made sure that we had planes out reporting, here's the convoy. Well, they misbombed it. And you, you, let, you let them get through. You let them get through. So that you didn't tip. Tip our hand that we had broke there were no messages. It had to weigh on your conscience. Very much so. There were times when we went to bed that I regretted and I said a deep prayer for those guys or people that were going to be killed. We, we had that occasionally happening. Yeah. We didn't always know the results that we passed on. It was passed on, we forgot about it. We weren't working. There was always a pile of death. Early in the war, there was maybe five or six for 25 guys. As the war went on, there were sometimes several hundred messages in one day. So you, you couldn't spend too much time on them. You had to be exhausted. Uh... It was. It was very dead. We would get maybe one day a week when we were at Mead, where we could go into Baltimore and walk around the town, 
there's a dam there, a water dam, just outside Loch Lomond. We'd go up there, there was an amusement park we'd go into, just to get away and be free. You were in civilian clothes or uniform? It depending. It really depended on what the newspapers were saying and what other things were going on. What did you tell people you were doing for a living and why, why you were in the Army? That was my cover story. Perfect story. I was an accountant. I'm doing Army payrolls in Washington. Every day I'd go to Washington from Fort Meade and do payrolls, go back to Fort Meade and stay there. And when you were discharged, what rank were you? I was a major. And every one of us, 25, had jobs to go to. I worked for this accounting firm during my summers when I was going to Pitt. And I was doing legwork, just inventories at warehouses and so forth. And they were just anxious for me to get back. They had a job for me. And uh, so I was waiting to get out to go to that, to, to go to a job. You, uh... And then it, all of us were interviewed to re-enlist. And not one of us re-enlisted because we had good jobs to go to. Well, you were well-educated and brilliant. Um, you, what was your wife's name and her maiden name? And when did you get married? How long did you court her? I courted her all during the war. I met her. She was five years younger than me. So at, at 20, I was 20 in June when I had to, went to Meade. And in July, I was 21. And I guess I had been deferred to finish my college. I don't remember what happened there. But I did finish my college. But uh, I went with her for about two years before, when I first met her, it was two years. And I got to know her family. They were real nice people. What was her name? Lois. Lois Elizabeth Klein, K-L-E-I-N. And they were uh, of, of German and French ancestors. Um, her dad worked for the telephone company. Um, so we got married in 43. I got 10 day furlough to come back to Pittsburgh, get married. We took the train to Pittsburgh, uh, to Chicago where my mother lived stayed at her apartment, and that was our honeymoon, going uh, to Chicago. Did, uh, did she live in, uh, near Fort Meade with you? Have you no, nope. we were not allowed to have any family living at Fort Meade. And they would come to visit us. We'd meet them either at the headquarters at uh, the reception area at Fort Meade or Washington. They were never in our building. We never were allowed to take them in our building. And children, did you have children? I did. We got married and in 43, and in April of 45, we had twins born. So we had the twin girls born. The government paid for all the expenses and everything. We didn't know that there were going to be children have twins because during the war, you didn't get a woman's examination until about the seventh month. And ours were born six and a half months. Oh, is that right? So she had never been examined. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And we had them in incubators. One was two five, one was two seven. We had them in incubators about six weeks. And my father-in-law, who worked for Bell Telephone on the road, he would go to the women's hospital in Pittsburgh and pick up mother's milk, which we had to buy to feed because Lois didn't have enough milk for two, two babies. What hospital were they born in? Uh, St. Joseph's on the south side of uh, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. I see. Yeah. And you know, uh, you kept talking about Colonel Johnson. What was Colonel Johnson's first name? Uh, Robert. Robert Johnson. Robert Johnson. Robert Johnson. Yeah. Colonel Robert Johnson. Yeah. And he was of Swedish background. Like and mother. I think that's the reason why. Like your mother. Yeah, I think he, I think that encouraged his friendship. With you. Yeah, I really do. Yeah. But 
all my life, I've tried to be honest, sincere. I worked for, when I got out of the Army, <clears throat> one week after I got out of the Army, a, a firm that I had worked on, a coal mining company in Pittsburgh, this accounting firm did their audit. And I worked on their place several times. And they were after me the last three months of my Army side time. When are you going to get home? We got a job for you. Hurry up. We want to. I said, I'm coming as soon as I can, but I got to wait a little discharge. And uh, I went to work for that coal company for one of the head officers. And I worked for him for 40 years. Is that right? I worked for him in Pittsburgh, and then we moved here. We bought another company out, and then we were bought out here by Peabody Coal Company, which is the biggest coal company in the world in the United States. So I worked for Peabody for all those years. Then my wife got Parkinson's disease. She was in her fifties, and uh, the uh, neurologist at Ohio State said, "Bergman, you're going to have a." tough road to go, she said. I said, all right, we'll live with it. And I asked my board of directors if I could take early retirement at 63. They said, fine, we'll give you all your benefits. We'll take care of your medical until you're 65, get under uh, Medicare. And the reason they did that, if I would die under the pension fund at that time, it was done. She got nothing. But by getting the money out of that pension fund in cash, I took the check to the bank and deposited it in Lois's my name. That took care of us until as time went on. That's Lucky. Yeah. Um, do you have uh, any other questions? Uh, well, oh, I have a trivia. That is, you end. You left the war as a major, and. Uh, we know that the upper-ranking officers have been long gone because they were older when they went in. It's possible you could be the highest-ranking guy from World War II. I have, you're the first person that I met uh, in the last five years uh, that ranked that high. I didn't want to be a... I wanted to, I've got two daughters. <laughs> I've got two twin daughters. You're an artifact. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a happy man. I, I had a wife for 55 years. We had a wonderful marriage. I didn't cat around. I, I was just a good guy. I saw so many fellas that drank, run around on company money, on trips. I didn't do that. I, I was very, I was strictly a family man and I'm happy about it. Did you, uh, did you uh, stay acquainted with any of your code breakers oh, after the war? Every, after, I, was, I was the secretary of our 25 guys at Meade. I had all their home addresses. After the war, I says, when we were leaving, I says, here's my address now. If you make any changes, remove anything, keep in touch with me. Phone me or, or write me. So I kept a manual of all the 25 men. Every five years, they would bring us to Washington. We would go in some of their old units that were carrying on, and they wind and dine us. Well, each five years, we were less accepted, less accepted. Finally, whenever it was in the 1980s, about 85, we finally, all that time, we kept saying, when are we going to be released? We want to tell our families. Well, finally, in 85 or 86, whatever it was, they released us. We quit having reunions, but I kept keeping track of the guys. Every Christmas, I sent a newsletter of our 25 that I had received during the year. Well, they started dying off dropping off. Well, two years ago, there were three of us left. One was in Philadelphia, one was in Florida, and myself in Columbus. 
Well, then, since then, the two have died. I'm the last one of the 25. Last survivor. Are the names of those 25 public information now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I wrote to their widows for a year or two, and then I, I just, for, I, had, I had enough to do with my own. That, that game, that story is gone. Brian, do you have anything you would like to add? Yeah, so, well, the first one, we always like to ask, where were you when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Where were you when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Do you remember you hearing about Pearl Harbor? Where were you? I was at, I was back home. No, I, w I was, that would have been in December, uh, Seven of fifty-one, a uh, forty-one. Um, I was at Mead that day when we got word. A good part of that story about Joe Rokeford, one of the nicest working men I've ever met, other than some of the others. He got a lot of the fourteen weather messages or diplomatic messages that was the instruction to all the embassies around the world to destroy their enigma, their uh, purple machine and all their code books and all their stuff that they had, secret stuff. At the end of December, they sent the Supreme Court judge and a couple members to Pearl Harbor to interview Roquefort and find out what went on, why those messages didn't finally get to Washington. Well, the truth is, well, anyways, there was confusion on that, delay and everything. Shortly after that, two captains in Washington it was, their names were the, uh, they were brothers, and they were both Navy captains, and they were in intelligence, Army inte uh, Navy intelligence. They arranged to have Roqueford transferred from Hawaii to Treasure Island in charge of a dry dock. A brilliant code man mm -hmm. was put on a dry dock because of politics, because he overshadowed those two captains. That's another unwritten story. Is that actually what, that's what happened to Rufford after he broke the, the Battle of Midway? That's after the Battle of Midway. And that's another, that's a good, very good story. Very good story. You got time to do that? Well, might as well if you want on tape. Yes. Well, Roker had been monitoring these messages out of Tokyo. And in Tokyo, as always, among the belligerent countries or the friendly countries or the associated countries, they have their State Department dinners and receptions and, and parties. Our representative of the Dutch were at one of the parties and one of the Japanese officers made the comment that this fleet was leaving Tokyo on a mission. So Roquefort was listening for messages, cut, but there was radio silence. So knowing what was going on at the war at that time, he knew that Midway was going to be in the Japanese way. They were going to have to take Midway and then take Pearl Harbor to protect their perimeter. So he was, had his people and their spies and so forth, and this fleet was leaving, this war fleet. Well, the fleet split up. Part of it went to the Lucian Islands as a diversity. The other fleet, silence. 
Roquefort and his ability to work on messages and what he knew, he thought, I'm certain the messages that have been coming around were AF. The Japanese had plotted all of the Pacific in blocks. AF was the block for Midway. Messages were coming through about something regarding AF, AF. He told the Nimitz and the other... Policy. I'm trying to think. Halsey, Hall, yeah, Halsey and Nimitz. One I think was in the hospital. He had uh, some kind of allergy problem or something. He said, I would suggest you send a message to Midway, to the Marine Commandant, and tell him, this was under code, secured code, send a message back to Pearl Harbor saying, we're short of water, our desalting plant broke down. Soon after that message was sent, a message came from somewhere, AF is out of water. I think that was someone listening someplace among the Japanese, mm -hmm. AF is out of water. So Halsey, they knew that fleet was coming down. We only had, I think, three carriers, and one was in dry dock in Pearl Harbor that had just come back from the South Pacific. I think it was the Lexington, I think was the one, or one of the aircraft carriers. Ray, is that was in dry dock there, being repaired on a three-week schedule. Overnight, in a couple days, they did what they absolutely had to do, and that aircraft carrier went with these other two and sat out about 700 miles away from the route that would take the, the Japanese to Midway. They estimated the time that that fleet would take to get there. The fleet got there. They unloaded the plane, they un uh, brought the planes up, fueled them, armed them with bombs, because you bomb land, you use torpedoes on ships. They put bombs on them, and that first wave of those three carriers went to Midway. While they were on that flight, the next flight out of the bottom of the ships were on the deck adding fuel and bombs. That's when some of our scouting planes of our aircraft carriers that had been following the fleet about where they were, well, they finally come out of the clouds and saw the Jap fleet, where it was Brokeford had found they would be. We attacked their three aircraft carriers. Four, in fact, four, four aircraft carriers. Attacked the four. We lost a lot of the bombers in the planes we had, the, the Scott planes. I think there was only one out of... George Gay. The guy that was in the water with a... George Gay. Yeah, had a life preserver over his head and so forth. The, those four carriers caught on fire. In the meantime, this first flight of planes coming back from the first bombing mission couldn't land because they were refueling these other planes. And they were trying to change from bombs to torpedoes. Right. So there was absolutely confusion and, and gas, uh, air, uh, uh, aviation fuel all over the decks. Uh, well, as you know, they lost four carriers out of five. That fifth one had tailed back. And they not only lost the carriers, but the planes that were in the sky, we, they lost 300 of their best, or their only pilots. They did not have a training program. They had no backup at that time. 
They had all these young ones back that were learning to be pilots, and it was too late. I think that's pretty well. Uh, and for that, Rushford got demoted. He got demoted. That's that's something we never hear about. No, you don't. Well, that thing about Joseph Kennedy, that that was just buried. Yeah. And Joseph Ken uh, wrote for they would just bury that. Uh, it's interesting. It's very interesting the luck we have and what happened and how it was done. When you were working at, at me, were you working shifts? What what was you, what time would you have to come in to work and how long did you work and did it work twenty four hours or it depend on how much traffic came into us. If there was a lot of traffic, we'd work on each one, take a message or two and work on it. Um, if one would have trouble with another one, but he was making some headway, we would maybe, as a team of two, would work together. Um, sometimes there was a pile there that we couldn't, in time lag, we couldn't do anything about. You just had to, people were going to be killed, we had to do anything about it. Oh, another, I want to give you one more clue, too. We also found out from messages that the Japanese sent their ambassador to Berlin. Uh, the Japs were very close to Hitler. And they sent their ambassador to Berlin to visit with Hitler. Hitler played up to them, and he gave that ambassador open privilege to go visit all of Normandy, visit all the gun emplacements and everything. When the ambassador got back to his room, his hotel, he wrote out a diplomatic message to Tokyo about his visit and of all the armament and where it was on Normandy. He sent that message back to Tokyo by cable. The cable from Berlin went to England, to London. That was the cable traffic, went to London. England was tapping that line. So that was a big help for Eisenhower to plan the Normandy invasion. That was a big help. I'll tell you one other thing about the uh, uh, Doolittle Raid. Right before the war, a, an American baseball player, he originally was from Toledo, Ohio, he was a catcher. He was a mediocre catcher, but in the big leagues, they always needed a third catcher. His name was, uh, I'll have to think of his name now. Moberg. Moberg, that's right, Moberg, that's it, Moberg. Moberg went with an exhibition group of baseball players to Japan to play in one of their baseball leagues as an exhibition game. The one day, Roquefort, now we don't know, we still have ne never been able to figure out how, why, or what. He went to the Tokyo Hospital to visit the ambassador's wife, who was a patient there. He got on the elevator, went up, got off at the top elevator floor, and took the stairway up to the roof. He got up on the roof. He had an eight millimeter camera, and he stood up there and he surveyed 365 of Tokyo. The factory smokestacks and buildings and so forth. That night, that cartridge was in the diplomatic pouch to Washington, and that was used for the Doolittle raid. So the pilots and the navigator could see where they were going. Very true. But it was perfect. Yes, it was. He didn't even get in to see the ambassador's wife. That's <laughs> all he did. And the Japs never knew anything about it. And that was before the war. Yes. So we knew things were heating up. We 
There were many indications. Did you know about the mock-up beaches we, of Normandy that we built in England? Yeah, that was the first division that Patton was going to handle. Right across from Port of Calais. Port of Calais. And he was there by himself with a couple technicians that were moving the things around, putting fires in the buildings so their smoke was coming out the stack, but there was nobody there. There was also a mock-up of Omaha Beach that was built over there. Oh. Did you, were you aware of that no, one? No, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, well, you may have just cleared up the mystery uh, about where that information came from to build that beach. That's. Uh, which, which came from a forward observer on Omaha Beach yeah. who, who lived here and, yeah. and uh, Bill Smith, who you probably knew yeah. or, at some point. That's an interesting connection. Did, uh, did you meet any other uh, high-ranking generals that, you know, you met Eisenhower, of course? Eisenhower, and uh, I never met Patton, and just met Churchill and the people at the Black Sheep Park. That was about it. That's enough. That was enough. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't want me, or us, to fraternize too much. We went with some of that we were known with, but they didn't want us to spread out. Now, when you went to meet Churchill the second time, you were married. Yeah. Did your wife know you were going to meet Churchill? No, no. I, I wasn't able to tell her anything until 1985. Nothing. <laughs> Not a word. Okay. Did, did and I, I, when I went to these reunions every five years, I went alone. We didn't take our wives. Uh. Can, can, you, can you tell us how you told that to your wife when you were finally able to tell you what you did during the war? Can you, can you remember that day? I, I remember that? the day very vividly. My wife, and my, at that time I had two daughters. I had another one born here 10 years later. Um, they said, Dad, you were doing payrolls. I said, no, I had a lie. I said, I've been lying for 40 years. <laughs> I had to. We all had to. That was our orders. We didn't trust the Warring countries of the world, China, Russia, and especially France. France was a bed of, oh, it was horrible. So what was their reaction, your family? Did they believe you? Oh, they believed me, but uh, and especially then, they knew I had this correspondence with these men that I had been in the service with. My wife knew I kept that book because I was getting mail once in a while and phone calls. Was this over dinner that you told her this, or was it just casual in the... I don't remember. I just, just told her one. <laughs> I got them to three of them together in a room, and I said, I've got now news to tell you. They wouldn't believe me. They said, Clinton, you were doing payrolls. I said, no, I was doing something else. Why didn't you tell us? I said, we weren't allowed to tell you. Why? Why? Now, I wanted to ask you one question. You were, uh, were you awarded a Purple Heart? Yep. And what other medals did they seem to give you? Well, <laughs> I don't know why, but I got the Purple Heart and I got a Bronze Star for that one operation. And I don't know why they gave it to me, because I think it was just the savvy me to keep me happy, maybe. You mean the mission over in Yeah, in, in, in uh, Burma. Yeah, Burma. I mean, I mean, I didn't do anything, but... Well, you got wounded for sure. Yeah, but I, I went up in a plane and was with these guys, and I got back home. and. I'm living today, why, why? We had no ceremony of any kind, of any appreciation, anything. We among us would celebrate if we broke some messages, but there was never a, a meeting where, oh, I got the Purple Heart. I mean, we didn't, we just forgot about it. It was just personal and that was it. We, none of our fellows were eagle-minded, really, I, I can't believe how 25 guys could be so friendly and close and so forth and not get at each other's backs once in a while. So, as I said, we had a couple of fellows who were Jewish. We had a number of, about half Catholic, half Protestant. And we'd go to, the, we'd get a Sunday or a Saturday, whenever. We'd go for maybe this guy's church and he'd go to confession. Or this guy, we'd go and go to a movie together. Not all of us at one time, though. Usually it was just little groups. Did you have a religious background yourself? 
I was raised a Lutheran because my mother was Swedish Lutheran. Yeah, that makes sense. But uh, uh, I, I'm a strong believer in the Bible. I'm, I'm strong in my faith because so many good things have happened to me. Uh, Ten years ago, I, they found my aortic valve wasn't running very well. So they cut me down here, opened me up, and put a cow valve in, manufactured cow valve. Mine, not a pig valve, but a cow valve. And put it in, sewed me back, and wired me back. And I'm doing fine. Um, are there any critical messages that you remember deciphering and breaking that you can share with us? And before we uh, finish our interview? That's, that's the ones that really the kids enjoy hearing. Those, those were big operations. Uh, I'm trying to think of any other words. Of, that's pretty well the ones I, I... I'm a great... My hobby, I don't play golf. I've got a set of golf clubs, never use them. Uh, I read a lot of history books. I love reading about World War II. Uh, people give me Civil War and World War I. It doesn't interest me. I'm interested because I was involved in two. And the same with the Mideast now. Now, I've, um, I was program director at the Senior Center. I think I told you a little while ago. And I had a speaker a month for 10 years. And I, I'm amazed how many people I pulled out of the woodwork to talk. The Navy, I had, a, I had a Navy flyer uh, came to our meeting one day and he said he was a Navy flyer in the Korean War. And I said, well, would you talk at our group sometime? And I said, forget about it. I'm not going to talk to anybody. About a week later, the phone rang. He says, John, I've been thinking over, it was I think a Thursday or Friday, he says, can you come over Saturday morning and sit with me? So I went over, he lived alone over near the high school here. We had a cup of coffee and he smoked cigarettes that were just dropping all over the place, fat one right after the other. And I said, uh, will you talk with our group? Is that what you're gonna talk about? Would, would you talk about it? He says, yes, I will, I will talk about it. Well, I scheduled them for about three weeks in advance. That was our meetings were always on Monday. On Saturday, I got a call from him. He says, John, I got bad news. He says, the doctor discovered I've got lung cancer. I'm going in Riverside. I won't be able to speak at your group. So I had to get another speaker. About two weeks later, he was dead. Mm -hmm. I went to his funeral. His son and daughter were there. They had a flag on his casket. And I said, did you know your dad had the Navy star? No, we didn't, never heard that story. I said, he was quite a hero. He had told me this story at breakfast. He was flying off an aircraft carrier off of North Korea. They were the troops were going up to the Chosen Reservoir, and this army unit was sitting in the lower part of North Korea right over the border, and they were bombing that trail where these trucks were coming down, supplying these North Korean on the fight for South Korea. The, th the rest of the squadron dropped their bombs, and he told them, head back, to the ship. He had one more tank on his wing. Mm -hmm. A 
I'm going to make one more flyover on that supply trail, which was real narrow. He was lucky enough to hit the first truck on that trail. Then he headed back and he had us drop in South Korea, the northern part, where it hits North Korea. There was a field there, an emergency field, so he could refuel to get back to the ship. When he got back to the ship, the executive officer met him as he got out of his plane. He said, the captain wants to see you right away in his quarters. He goes back to the captain's quarters. The captain said, why were you late coming back when the other ones came back? He said, well, I had one wing tank and I thought I had enough gas to get back to our territory. He said, that's endangering your life, the plane. We didn't want you to do that. You know you shouldn't do it. Well, he said, I did it. He said, you come back tomorrow morning and you're going to be at the captain's table. I'm going to reprimand you. The next morning he came, got dressed up and came into the captain's quarters. There was a man sitting there in uniform. And the captain said, uh, you know you have some serious charges on you. But he says, we're going to get to forget about it. He said, this man here was one of the officers of that army or marine or whatever it was, company that the Japanese had surrounded. And these supplies were coming down for these North Koreans that had them surrounded. So he got the Na Navy Star. But he never told us, he told me, but he never told the kids. So I told him that at the funeral. Good story. Do you remember these stories? That's a good story. Good story. Excellent. Well, I want to uh, thank you so much for no. giving us this interview and all the intriguing and wonderful stories yeah. and remembrances. It'll be a great history for kids and people that want to review it. I think it's good. And this will give them an incentive to go to the library and follow it up. Yes, sir. It will.